Boas tardes, good afternoon, uh, good morning in, in Vancouver. I am Pepe uh, Jose Pintado, researcher and, and deputy director for scientific culture and engagement with society at uh, the Institute of Marine Research, I am M of the SIC, which is located in Vigo, in Galicia, in the northwest west, uh, coast of, of Spain. Um, I, would like you, I would like to give you the welcome and thank you for, for assistance to this new conference of the Symposium, dealing with the new frontiers in marine research, which, which is organized by the five institutes or that conduct marine research in CSIC. Uh, this conference will be given by, by Professor Daniel Pauli, and we thank him very much for accepting our invitation. Daniel will be introduced by Ryan Pierce, that's, who is research professor at the Department of Marine Ecology and Resources at our institute, EEM, uh, and I let him now uh, the ground, the floor. All right, thank you. Well, I, I guess for, for an, an audience of marine scientists, I shouldn't really need to introduce our speaker, Professor Daniel Pauli, but if you will indulge me for a few minutes, I'll try and do so nonetheless. Um, he completed his PhD at the University of Kiel back in 1979, um, during which he looked at relationships between the surface area of gills and the growth of fish and, and aquatic invertebrates, and that's a theme which we will obviously come back to. Um, he then joined ICLAM, the International Center for Living Aquatic Resources Management in the Philippines in 1979, initially as a postdoc, um, latterly as program and division head, and ultimately after he moved to Canada as a principal science advisor until 1997. But in 1994, he joined what was then the Fisheries Centre at the University of British Columbia as a tenured professor. In 1999, he initiated the Sea Around Us initiative, which is ongoing, and was named after Rachel Carson's 1951 book, and an initiative that aims to look at the impact of fisheries on marine ecosystems and offer mitigating solutions to a range of stakeholders. During 2003 to 2008, he was director of the Fisheries Center at uh, UBC, um, which is now uh, the Fisheries Center now being the Institute of Oceans and Fisheries. Since 2016, he's been University Killam Professor. Um, he has seven honorary doctorates. He's won numerous prizes. Um, I think one which the Spanish audience will know about is the Ramon Margalef Prize in Ecology which he was awarded in 2008. This is an award which comes with a sculpture of the microalga Picarola mar margalefii and is presented every year by the Generalitat of Catalonia in commemoration of Ramon Margalef. Um, he was also for a period, <laughs> also for a period, a, a regular visitor to, to Madrid um, being chairman of the jury for the BBVA Foundation's Frontiers of Knowledge Awards for six years. Um, he's the originator or, or co-developer of many familiar concepts, methods, um, software in marine ecology and fisheries. Um, for the older people among us, you may remember ELEFAN, electronic length frequency analysis, but also Ecopath, fish base, um, FISAT, the FAO ICLAM stock assessment tools, and of course, things like the shifting baseline concept and fishing down the food web. Um, if you look at Google Scholar, you will find a list of over 1,200 publications, um, papers, books, reports, with around 113,000 citations. And these include, well, the previously mentioned papers about fishing down food webs, um, shifting baselines, um, work on relationship between natural mortality growth parameters and environmental temperature, papers on sustainability in fisheries, primary production, catch reconstruction, and indeed a whole range of topics like 
diet composition and trophic levels of marine mammals. Perhaps most relevant to today's talk, we can see a, a paper on why squid, though not fish, may be better understood by pretending they are, something he gave as a talk at the Kefalpod International Advisory Council conference in Cape Town in 1997, which was subsequently a paper. He wrote a book about gasping fish and panting squids, oxygen temperature and the growth of water breathing animals in 2010. And he has recently published a paper about the gill oxygen limitation theory, um, which is what he's going to talk to us about today. So, Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I spend most of my time, first of all, I'm, I'm very thankful to be to have been invited here because I love Spain and even I I like so much to come to Madrid and to other cities and and uh, it was always nice and now we are stuck with COVID in our home and uh, I accepted this invitation by because uh, this is an opportunity to connect with you even though I cannot come in your beautiful country. Uh, over the years I have worked mainly on fisheries but uh, as mentioned by Graham I my initial my initial uh, my PhD was about uh, the gill area and the growth of fish because because I had been in Indonesia working for two years between my master and my PhD and I was I was uh, I was aware of the fact that we could not spend so much time as we do in in a, uh, around around in Europe and in North America around each species of fish we we would need a general theory that explains the growth of all fish so that we can predict the the growth of of fish for which we have little information and that became the the, the topic of my dissertation after I returned from indonesia and i developed the what i thought was really a major advance and uh, the response was zero i had <laughs> I published it in a in a in a little obscure journal, and uh, the response was zero. And and I I I I became aware that I better work on other things if I want to have a job. So I worked on fisheries, but uh, I kept some interest um, on on this on this issue of how fish breathe, and gradually because gradually uh, it evolved into uh, a, a series of well corroborated hypotheses and later became what I think is a theory. And I will, I return to it then gradually, and now I work mainly on it because global warming has come in into the picture. In the in 70s uh, and 80s, nobody cared about global warming, even though it was, it was coming. Um, it was beginning, but uh, uh, now that global warming is happening, that uh, the ocean are getting warmer, the lakes are getting warmer, and you can see it in the reaction of the fish. Uh, people are listening, and uh, the the theory, which had no name before, but now it's called Gill Oxygen Limitation Theory, uh, is becoming a little bit more familiar, and people are is getting more traction. And the idea of a theory is that it, it should uh, incorporate the stuff we know, we know to be the case, and it should provide guidance uh, as to what is worth looking at and uh, guidance as to how to look at things. So uh, I will now present the theory to you. Um, the idea being that, uh, uh, that it may provide guidance and 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 uh, some some ideas that may be relevant to your work. So uh, I show my screen. Uh, am I sharing it? Your entire screen. Oh, share. So you, can you see my screen? We we cannot yeah. yet. Not um, yet. Now, yes. Now, 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 yes. Next one. Yeah. Okay. So okay. now is my screen. Yeah. And 
And that is my presentation. So, so let's let's stop being mammals. Let's stop breathing air. Let's think we are fish. And we are breathing a medium to get the oxygen that we need in a medium that contains far less oxygen than a liter of air. It's almost like being on Mars. Uh, a liter of water contains 30 times less oxygen than a liter of air. The water is very dense, very viscose, and it, it is a, a big job if you are a quiet fish to bring the water across your gills. For us to breathe, it's easy to move the water in and out of our lungs. And also the diffusion of any molecules in, in water is 300 times slower in water than in air. So the processes, the exchange processes, uh, molecular processes are much slower. So it's not, it's not surprising that over the millions of years, uh, fish should have developed, developed large gills. And we have here a Devonian fish uh, about, well, I don't know if it's a fish, uh, that reached 15 centimeters. Why? Because the reconstructed head shows that the gills were actually very inefficient. They occupied a, lot, a, a small part of the, of the, of the head. And, and these fish probably were very quiet because they didn't have much oxygen to deal with. And if we compare that with, with a carp or with a basking shark, the, the head is full of gill. I, if, you, if, you, if you handle a, a, a teleos nowadays or a shark, uh, in the head, what you have is gills. And uh, the, the exception, obviously, is something like Arapaima in, uh, in the Peruvian and uh, uh, in the Amazon. And uh, they have a small head. And very small gills, but but they don't breathe water, uh, almost no water. They they have to come to the surface because they have lungs, and and they get the the, the oxygen they need from the water, from the air. And in fact, an arapaima, if you prevent it from getting to the surface, it will drown. It will die just like you if you are uh, uh, diving and cannot come to the surface. So gills are important. Now, you know what that is. <laughs> you, you are neighbors to France, and that is a, a French car. And uh, the reason why I present it to you, because it has such a prominent nose. And in front of the nose of this car is uh, the radiator. Now, what, how does a radiator work? Uh, uh, by the way, I'm, I've not lost. I'm not lost. I, 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 I want to present a radiator to you. It's not an, a mistake. So if you have an engine, the engine of a car, uh, that engine produces heat and motion, right? And uh, a lot of the energy is converted into heat, waste heat, and uh, the, the engine has to be cooled. So we have water circulating inside the engine, and this water is brought, is pumped to into the, the radiator, uh, and it leaves the radiator as uh, cooled, cool water. And how does it, how is it cooled? Because the radiator has lots of lamellae inside uh, through which uh, wa the water flows. And the heat of the water is picked up by the air that flows through the lamellae, across the lamellae. So that's how, how it works. Now, once the air has gone through across a radiator, it, it cannot be used anymore because it's hot. So it would not cool. Well, and that means the a radiator cannot work in three dimension. It works only in two. It, if you want to get a bigger engine, then you have to have a, a bigger radiator. There is more heat to cool. and uh, the radiator, you can make it larger in width, in height, but not in depth. Why? Because if the radiator is thicker or there are several radiators behind each other, the others would not work because the air that goes through them is already 
hot. Now, let's get back to gills. Gills work the same way as a radiator. Water gets in, uh, into the lamellae or between the lamellae, and it picks up carbon dioxide and it gives up uh, oxygen. And uh, we don't have to deal with uh, carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide reacts very fast and, and so fast that uh, the, the transfer doesn't need to be considered. But the oxygen uh, goes more slowly and it's only at the end when it has crossed the, uh, the lamellae that uh, the water that uh, the water is almost free of oxygen. So, so this lamellae form like a radiator that is two dimensional because, because uh, you cannot put lamellae behind lamellae because there is no more oxygen. So basically, even though the, the gills appear to be three dimensional, they function as a surface. Now a surface, cannot grow as fast as volume. A surface means that it will grow with a, a, with a lower power of length than a, than a volume a relative. The volume is, uh, is a, a length cube and a surface is length squared or a little bit more, uh, but uh, there is a limitation there. Because, and we can see that limitation. Here's the carp again. If we plot the weight of the carp, here is a log weight, and the surface area of the gills. Uh, when they are larvae, they, the surface area of the gills work very fast because the gills are actually built. The, 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 they are actually new gills that emerge in the la inside the larvae. Because at the beginning, the larvae gets its oxygen from the fins, uh, the, the surface of the fins. So the gills are being built and uh, they grow with a surface uh, with a power, uh, uh, a power of uh, length that is much higher than two. That is much higher than three, actually. But but when they are adult, when 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 they are, when they are metam metamorphosed, the the growth is actually uh, lower. The growth of the gill is slower than the growth of the weight. And it is 0.8 of the growth of weight in the case of of um, of, uh, of carp. This means that a bigger carp will have less of uh, gill area per body weight than a smaller carp. And you can see that here uh, empirical data in the middle. This uh, the 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 surface area of the gill per volume or per per weight declines rapidly uh, from the from the larvae to the adults. And there is a size at which the surface, the gill area per volume is so low that the fish cannot continue growing. And this is, this is uh, presented as a schematic here on in A. So you have the surface area of the gill per volume or per weight. And, uh, I call this the G line, the gill line. And, and it declines as the weight increase up to a certain value that where the fish gets just enough gill area per unit weight that for, for maintenance to, to survive. And if we call this maintenance metabolism, then the, it is... Uh, it is the level at which the, the fish cannot grow anymore. It can continue to live, but it cannot grow anymore. For example, uh, in uh, aquarium fish, they at, at a certain size, they stop, little aquarium fish, and that's it. You can feed them as much as you want. They won't grow more. And, and also in coral reef fish, uh, the, 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 the fish uh, have a certain size, uh, the little Ketodontidae or the little Acanturidae, and they, they don't go beyond that, but they can live years and years. Now, fish, uh, as you well know, and this is also true for invertebrates uh, that breathe water, um, are, are ectotherms. They don't have their own body temperature. 
they accept the the they have the temperature of the water around them. This is not true for tuna, big tuna, but but uh, this doesn't change my argument. The the point is that if you elevate the temperature of the water, uh, the it the the oxygen requirement will increase. Oops, will increase. What it means is that the 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 maintenance metabolism will hit the G line at a smaller size. And that really is all you need to understand why fish get smaller as will be smaller when the temperature is elevated. It is not necessarily because there is less oxygen in the water, which is also the case. There is less oxygen in water that is uh, dissolved oxygen if the temperature is higher. But uh, the change is very small. Whereas the change in metabolic requirement, the, the oxygen consumption increased very fast with temperature and, and uh, uh, the, the fish has to be smaller, uh, will, will remain smaller because uh, it meets, uh, the point is reached at a smaller size where maintenance metabolism and the supply from the, by other gills is met. And we could stop here because actually this is the main point, but we won't stop here because we have some time. And that explains why, for example, uh, you have uh, fish growing, <laughs> growing differently. And uh, the A is uh, from a certain paper. B is, uh, was published in uh, 1920 by Putter. And uh, on theoretical ground, he illustrated that a fish uh, can either get a uh, big, slow, or fast, but stay small. And this is exactly the situation that we have. And you will know it from fish in Spain that are both in the Mediterranean and in Galicia, for example. They can get uh, they can get slowly to a big size or fast to a small size. So that is explained simply because uh, of this change in metabolic rate. And the, as the assumption is that the gill area per, per weight is the same, the anatomy is the same. Then uh, a small change in temperature will uh, uh, have this as a result. And we, we, we wrote a paper uh, a while ago that was uh, where this, this was uh, used to project in the future a reduction of size in, uh, in, uh, in all fish in the world. Um, that is the one that will not die. And uh, this then caused uh, uh, some physiologists to argue that it is all wrong, this is all nonsense, the gill uh, can grow as much as they want, the fish can grow uh, can grow new gills, and uh, and um, that's the reason why I went back to to the work that I did to my dissertation, and uh, and um, ex to explain things better. And I there was uh, uh, I now will explain the detail of the logic of this of the gold. And those of you who it's a bit boring, and those of you who are uh, who have waken up uh, very early today, you can go to sleep for the next 10 minutes because it's kind of boring. And it starts with the growth rate. Growth rate is perceived in the theory for von der Talanfi and Putter as uh, the difference between two processes. One is protein synthesis and the other is protein degradation. The protein synthesis requires oxygen, which, which uh, comes from through the gills, from the water, and which is used in uh, in th for the production of ATP that uh, use itself amino acids on one hand and oxygen on the other hand. The, it's like in a car when you bring the fuel, the the fuel, the gasoline, and the and the, and the, and the oxygen of the air, they 
that is a mixture that explodes. Here, it is a mixture that that generates uh, that feeds protein synthesis through ATP, and uh, uh, this process then is is a function of the weight, uh, but it's also a function of the power of the gills growth because if the gill uh, as the weight grows the the uh, uh, the rate of synthesis doesn't grow very fast because the great rate of synthesis is is a function of gill size so, so that uh, that I just explained and uh, in fish uh, you can see this uh, limitation the value of d the, the small d here, uh, you can see that it is 0.8 in most fish, and it is about 0.6 in guppies, and uh, it 0.9 in tuna, and in larvae, which are not oxygen limited, it is it is one. The larvae grow do not grow asymptotically. You will see in a minute that larvae have a different growth. And here we have the growth of larvae, and larvae grow exponentially because they are not oxygen limited. And this growth goes up to uh, the point where there is metamorphosis. And when they metamorphose, they, they turn into little fish called fingerlings. And these fingerlings grow according to, to uh, the asymptotically, meaning they are becoming oxygen limited. Uh, oh my gosh. Um, and this is uh, this has been studied very well by uh, by people in the past when uh, when they were not looking only at DNA and um, but rather at anatomy and the surface area of gills uh, for herring and place uh, has been studied and you can see the break that happens. But this is not how fish adult fish grow. They grow asymptotically, meaning the growth uh, is rapid at first and then it declines. Here, it's the opposite. It, it, is, it is slow at first and then rapidly accelerates. So now I have to explain what protein degradation is. What is it? Because uh, why we don't rot. So what is it? Uh, what is it? It is, it is uh, uh, the, the, human, the body of an animal is composed essentially of protein, and proteins are chains of amino acids, right? And this chain form helixes. And the helixes uh, are coiled, are, are, are form other chains which are coiled, as shown in the, in the, um, in the upper left corner. These chains are coiled. And, and it's, uh, they had uh, the primary structure, primary structure is the sequence of amino acid. Then there is an helix uh, that forms around that, and the helix, ellipse, helix foil, uh, fold itself. And this is called quaternary structure. And a protein works only when it has this shape, a specific shape. For example, hemoglobin. <clears throat> hemoglobin works only if it has this specific shape and it, it has <clears throat> it can then uh, form a, some sort of a cage that can uh, deal with uh, the atoms of uh, iron in this case now this shape is maintained by very weak bonds very weak bonds uh, uh, hydrogen bonds and they, they can be destroyed by heat very easily. Heat, warmth, heat is uh, nothing but movement of molecules, right? And the more, the hotter something is, the stronger the movement of the molecules. And it's like little shocks. And this structure can be, can be broken by simply by Brownian motion, by little shocks. 
And the more the temperature is high, the higher temperature is, the more this uh, structure breaks down. But as soon as a structure of that type breaks down, it, it cannot function as an enzyme or it cannot function in its job. Uh, for example, hemoglobin, if it has another shape, it doesn't work. So the Brownian motion simply destroyed the, uh, the protein in it, 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 through a process called denaturation. And denaturation uh, happens all the time and it's temperature dependent. So once the protein are denatured, they become part of the amino acid pool and that is also fed by the food that the fish eat because the protein are also digested into amino acid and this amino acid are fuel to the energy metabolism now this energy metabolism then is key what the atp that it produces what is it used for well it's used for protein synthesis here or it's used for either activities breathing, swimming, foraging, digesting, osmotic work, and so on. So all of this is the oxygen that comes from gill area is, is used either for the activities or the protein synthesis. And that's why in aquaculture, for example, uh, in, in modern aquaculture, so much money is spent on bringing oxygen into the water. Uh, and uh, I have these pictures from, from colleagues in China, and they spend uh, in uh, a huge amount of money in their pond to bring oxygen into the water because they know that feeding the fish is not sufficient. You must also bring them lots of oxygen. So these activities, again, uh, are compete for oxygen inside the body. So, for example, if you take two fish that are uh, the same species, but one is domesticated uh, and the other is wild type, and you come straight from nature, and you give them the same amount of food, the same condition, the domesticated part will be more, more quiet and will not use its, its oxygen for 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 darting around for moving around it will be quiet like a what like cows you if you look at a cow uh, in a farm it, it it is quiet most of the time a wild a wild uh, bovine is uh, very active and uh, they grow differently uh, uh, fish that are wild and fish that are domesticated because the wild type is afraid all the time of predators. The domesticated version doesn't care about predators because they are protected from that. So this then explains why, for example, why female fish grow better than male fish. You, I will explain this here. Lots of people believe that when uh, the that fish grow fast until they mature and then depending on the condition depending on whether they're male or female they grow some more or as a function of how much energy they spend for gonad production uh, so the the idea is that growth is limited by gonad production by reproduction but this <laughs> this, this is not true if you look at a, a fish like a, a cod Bacalao, uh, they the weight at first maturity is happens before they the growth accelerates. The growth actually accelerates after they mature. Uh, the you when you when you plot the growth in length, you get a false impression of what happens because growth actually involves mass and in, it involves weight and spawning in fish happens before the growth is uh, the, the, the happens 
so early that the growth accelerates after they spawn. So spawning is not the cause for them to grow fast, to grow slower, as you get the impression from looking at this. But uh, it has nothing, spawning has nothing to do with the, the effect on growth. It's actually not, not uh, spawning that influence growth, but it's actually growth that influence spawning. And you're going to see that in a second. And this also explains why females are getting bigger than males in the majority of fish. In about 80%, not 70%, I have recalculated it, in of the species, 78, say 70 to 80% of the species, it's the female that get bigger. If the reproduction was the reason, the cost of reproduction was the reason for the fish to stop growing, right? Then the female, which invest far more, far more in reproduction, and ask your wife, if you if you are male, ask your wife and or your girlfriend about it. Uh, they they invest far more in reproduction than males, and they get bigger. They get bigger in eighty percent of the cases, seventy percent of the cases, they get bigger than the males. So that cannot be the reason why they stop growing. The reason why they stop the male uh, uh, grow not so well as the as the female is actually because the female are a little bit more active, and they don't have to be a little bit more active. It doesn't have to make much of a difference because only five to ten percent of the food that fish get is used for growth and reproduction. The rest is all activity. Uh, and if you reduce the activity a little bit, only a little bit, you can grow much faster. So we jump here. Another thing is, if you feed fish in aquaculture or in experiment, you will see that the food conversion efficiency always decline with size. You you will not find in the literature any explanation that makes sense. They will say, oh, they, this is this is an age effect. It's not an explanation. This is a restatement of the problem. Uh, the the reason why they, they the the fish get uh, the food conversion efficiency, that is the growth per unit uh, food consumed, why it goes down is because they have less oxygen to utilize that food, and uh, that is then you have an intercept. They they the growth, the growth, uh, the food conversion efficiency becomes zero at at the maximum size, which is uh, like a definition. And if you feed fish also in in a lab or in aquaculture, you will see that uh, from a certain size on, they don't they don't eat more because if they ate more, they uh, they don't grow, and so they 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 would uh, they would uh, just give work to the stomach and to the intestine for nothing so they leave the food out when they are very big and they are in aquarium and stuff they leave the food they don't eat it because they don't get the oxygen per unit weight that they need this is uh, also the case now here is an explanation for another phenomenon the gold gives an explanation Many of you have heard of daily wings in uh, the larvae of fish or in young fish or invertebrates, in squids and in other invertebrates. You have, especially in the larvae, you have daily wings. How is this explained? Well, it's explained as by a succession of low pH, high pH. When a fish is quiet, say at night, it is sleeping, the oxygen that it gets uh, uh, is sufficient to keep the pH high. And uh, the matrix that is, that is uh, built in uh, autolytes is, has, orga contains organic material. During the day, when the, when the fish is active, 
the pH goes down because there is carbon dioxide in the body of the fish that is not processed because it can be that uh, and evacuated and the pH goes down. And then in that case, you have a low pH and a low pH means acid and uh, the, the matrix of the otolith is etched, it's, uh, it's pitted. And so that you have a succession of etched, non-etched, etched, non-etched. Non -etched. There is no other explanation for the existence of daily wings of, uh, in fish. Uh, and uh, in fish larvae. And now, when the fish get bigger, when the body weight increases, uh, the difference between day and night becomes almost the same. Uh, there is no more difference. And so, because they have no latitude, uh, they have no, oops. Um, and so, you cannot, when the fish are adults, you cannot see these rings. And this is the case. You cannot age big fish with uh, daily wings. You can age only small fish. And here is uh, evidence for it, uh, more or less Nin. You, you, know, you know her very well. This is, uh, she's a well-known um, uh, uh, Spanish scientist. She has established that uh, in young fish, the, the otolith contain far more protein nitrogen than those in big fish of the same species that is it 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 requires it it is explained by the gold it's not explained anywhere anywhere else and another thing that is amazing is that if you if you take a whole fish and put it in a in a blender and and, and make a soup out of it and look at what enzyme are in there in the muscle flesh. You will have, in big fish, you will have mainly glycolytic enzyme, enzyme that work in the absence of oxygen. If you take small fish, you will have mainly enzyme that work with, in, uh, with oxygen, in oxidative uh, uh, enzymes. So that work in the presence of oxygen. So basically, as a fish get big, it is it's turning sour and it's turning sour because it doesn't get enough oxygen and you can see that particularly in tuna fisheries uh, if the if the tuna is uh, is angled uh, is fighting on the line the 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 lactic acid build up in the body is so strong that the flesh is cooked and they call this burnt tuna. Uh, that is the same, uh, I don't know if you have, in Peru they eat ceviche. Uh, you also have that in Spain, right? Ceviche. This is burnt, the, the flesh is cooked by acid uh, vinegar. Uh, here, the flesh is cooked by uh, lactic acid which comes from muscles that move in the absence of oxygen. And, and so you have to avoid uh, playing a, a, a tuna because otherwise it will work. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, try running three times fast around the house and you will see, you will have uh, lactic acid in your legs and you will know what I'm talking about. Now, now, those of you who have been sleeping should be waking up because that is uh, going to be a little bit harder. If, if, if fish uh, are limited in their growth by oxygen and at W infinity 1, the oxygen is just enough to live, just enough to maintain yourself, then, then they have to spawn earlier, right? And they have to spawn at, uh, at, at a smaller size. It's only WM for maturity. And if they do, then they do that at a level of oxygen consumption that is higher than the oxygen consumption at 
at uh, W infinity. I call it Q infinity. So QM is higher than Q infinity. And okay, now you move to the right side and you increase the temperature or you, you stress the fish, you chase them or something. Well, they will have to be smaller to remain smaller because, uh, because, uh, ox because they need more oxygen for maintenance. So they will be smaller. Well, if they spawn, if they spawn at the same size as in A, they would, uh, <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't spawn there. So they will have to spawn earlier, right? They have to adjust their spawning to the higher metabolism they have. Because so QM will be higher than Q infinity in B. Now, QM, Q infinity one the, has a certain ratio. QM two and Q infinity two also has a certain ratio. And now the point is that this ratio is the same in all fish. Uh, that, that I discovered that in uh, 84, uh, and uh, this is a graph where that has guppy on one end and tuna at the other end and all standard fish uh, on the average are uh, in between. And again, the reaction was nothing, nothing. And uh, the review was, was incredible because I had, I had five, not only negative review, but aggressive, nasty review. And they were so nasty that uh, the editor thought it was interesting. And uh, they, they send, he sent it, uh, he sent the paper to uh, David Cushing. He, it was a, a scientist uh, uh, well known at the time. And, uh, and he said, obviously, Daniel is right. And so it was published against five negative review. And this paper then, I abandoned it for a while, but recently I have begun looking at other fish and the ratio is the same everywhere. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I have written, uh, I have two or three papers in press with, which show that uh, uh, the ratio is actually the same. Uh, this is uh, for, um, for uh, tilapia and, and fish lead fish. And another paper has been just submitted that uh, has uh, 150 species of Chinese fish. I, I worked with Chinese colleagues and the same ratio was found. And uh, the, it, it's amazing how this ratio is conserved throughout uh, the old fish. And I, I suppose also invertebrate, but that it needs to be shown. Now, we have also that this observation from taxonomist that tropical fish grow to large size at in the uh, in the colder part of their range and uh, and grow smaller to the this also is all confirmatory evidence and uh, we can see that uh, in, for example, in Europe, uh, uh, when you study in Germany, you, you learn something called Heinke's law. Um, Heinke is a German who working in, uh, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, who has uh, drawn draw this beautiful map on the left that shows place uh, being very small, when they are very small, being in the hot water um, in uh, on the coast, and the bigger they get, uh, they they become uh, they go into deeper water. You can see that also in this on the graph on the right, um, where uh, two two Hawaii fish uh, uh, go deeper uh, as they grow bigger, uh, and you can ask yourself why do they do that? Well, the temperature gets gets lower in as you get deeper and and so they can continue to grow and 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 in spite of the 
of the big size in spite of the oxygen uh, requirement because uh, they when the temperature goes down the oxygen requirement goes very strongly down and so they can continue to grow by going into deeper water and another another phenomenon is that you you can also explain migration better um, with the gold. Uh, you will recognize this coast as being West Africa, in Senegal in the south, Senegal and Gambia in the south, Mauritania in the middle, and uh, the border, the southern border of Morocco or Spanish Sahara <laughs> uh, uh, in A, and uh, the Sardinella. They they go and 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 they they migrate all along the coast. Uh, so does uh, Pomatomus pathatix. So does Epinephalus, and and lots of other fish do that. And you could say, how why do they do that? How do they know what to where to go? Well, if you plot the temperature at different season at different places, you can see that uh, that they that they actually maintain the temperature in which they are. And why? Because temperature is really affecting them because a temperature that is too high forces them, forces the uh, oxygen requirement to go up and they can't and, and so they have to move. Now, this is the reason then why fish uh, are moving with global warming. And uh, we have uh, a paper here uh, that uh, we published uh, in 2009, and uh, that shows that basically uh, the the fish that are moving north in the northern hemisphere and south in the southern hemisphere, uh, they they carry a catch potential, and uh, what we'll have then. Uh, in for Norway and uh, northern Alaska, you will have an increase uh, for a while uh, uh, of uh, the possibility to catch fish, whereas in the tropics, you will have a decline uh, uh, of catch potential. And this uh, was the first map that showed global warming effect on for the ocean, for humanity. And... Uh, this was uh, used by the IPCC uh, in the fifth assessment, uh, the summary for policymaker. It was it was quite we were quite proud about that because this was before that you always had the effect of global warming on predicted effect uh, for the continent, but not uh, for the sea. And now global warming is not something that will happen. Or that is happening now. It has begun already in in the 70s, in the sense that the fish could detect it already in the 70s, and especially in the North Atlantic, in the Med, in the North Sea, and the North Pacific. Now, what we did then, uh, we we invented a new indi indicators indicator for uh, for ocean warming. And this indicator is based on the fact that the preferred temperature of fish is built in uh, a species very at very very much inside because the a species will have a, um, will be adapted to a certain temperature by having all its enzyme uh, functioning uh, best at that temperature. And it is very difficult for a species to change its temperature preference because uh, it is not one thing that has to be changed. For example, it's color. Uh, color change, very, very easy to achieve. But uh, it's not one thing. That is, lots of enzyme would have to be changed. The enzyme that works best at a degree would have to be changed to an enzyme that works best at 10 degrees and so on. So that is very difficult. It takes forever for fish to change the preferred temperature. So we can we can see it as a constant thing. 
we can see it as constant. And the temperature preference, we can estimate it roughly by looking at the temperature at the center of the distribution, the average temperature at the center of the distribution. So uh, for this packet of fish, this one uh, uh, eight degrees, this one 10 degrees and so on. And we can then compute the marine, the mean trophic level, the mean temperature of the catch for any, uh, any group of fish. For example, the fish caught by Spain in the Mediterranean or the fish caught by Spain in Galicia or, or the fish caught by Japan in the North Atlantic. And, and we can look at the, the mean temperature of the catch. And the mean temperature of the catch, you can see uh, in the upper graph, uh, it, for most uh, large marine ecosystem, it actually changes very much like temperature itself. So the mean temperature of the catch since the 70s has increased, and so has the actual temperature right and that for any country or any ecosystem this is due the change of mean temperature of the catch is due to fish that are that uh, tolerate uh, low temperature leaving and fish that tolerate high temperature coming in so in spain for example you have fish that before were in morocco and the cold water fish are now going to to the uk Right, the, that is a transition that is happening. We can see it in all countries uh, of the world. Now in the tropics, the, the second graph, the, the graph below, there is a, a, a massive difference. The sea surface temperature will increase, but uh, the, the MTC, the mean, trophic, uh, mean temperature of the catch, can increase only in the beginning. Uh, because uh, some fish will be leaving the tropics, uh, subtropical fish, for example, can leave the tropics. But then what happens? They, they, they are in the tropics, they are tropical fish, they don't like it because it's getting too warm, but there is no re replacement by hypertropical fish because the hypertropics don't exist. So what you have is that situation. In, in, uh, in, most ecosystem that we know of, the temperature ocean and the subtropic, for example, in, in Spain, uh, in the Med and outside of the Med, you had uh, fish with cold water affinities in the 70s and uh, some with warm water affinities. And in the year 2000, the fish with warm water affinities have diminished and they have been replaced by fish with warm water affinities. And the future, we're going to have only fish with warm water affinities. Now in the tropics, you start with fish that have warm water affinities. So what will happen? What happens is that you, you have fewer fish uh, now, and in the future, you will have even less. And that is extremely worrisome, but we don't find any reason why this is not correct. And so, I, I will end here because, because you have, I have explained a theory that I uh, have presented a theory that explains why fish are extremely sensitive to temperature through via oxygen uh, supplies that, that uh, cannot keep up with uh, the, with the individual growth and I end up with a uh, an application to global warming and you can everything that uh, I have presented you to you is uh, they are paper peer reviewed paper that I can send and I would be pleased to send them to you. Thank you very much. So. So. So, so thank you very much. Um, I see there are a few questions which have come up in, in the chat. So, if if you're willing to take questions now, I, I, I am, guess we I will. Am we we shall take them in the order in which they arrived in the chat. So the first question I saw was from Pablo Peter 
Pablo, do you want to ask your question? Um, Jaime, can you allow people to speak, please? Yeah, I'm going to do that now. Sorry for that. There you go. They should be able to share the so, microphone. So, Pablo, are, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? If well, okay, I'm not hearing Pablo. So what he said was, if fish growth is not affected by reproductive investment, why do aquaculture researchers try to produce infertile fish? Are they wrong? Uh, basically, basically, um, uh, the activity connected with spawning um, is what uh, make them. Um, for example, tilapia, uh, the, the, you farm only males and uh, in, uh, the male grow better. And what, what you do when you have only males, uh, uh, they don't fight uh, over the female and their activity uh, budget is uh, reduced. And so they, they grow. Uh, if you compare uh, Neloticus, the Oreochromis Neloticus tilapia, uh, that is farmed with wild tap, um, they are extremely quiet, um, and uh, so it's not it's not the the production of gonads that uh, that is the 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 weight of of uh, that cause um, the deficit in growth. It is the fighting and uh, use of of oxygen for activities, um, and so what when we when we farm uh, quiet animals, when we farm when we have well growing fast growing animal, we have quiet animals. And I had a a, a thesis, and I will be pleased to send it to the colleague. You just send me an email. I had a thesis. Uh, uh, um, done by a student who looked at the behavior of male Orochromis neuroticus. Uh, they were uh, the fast growing, they were gift fish. Uh, gift is a, a strain of fast growing tilapia and wild tap. And the wild tap uh, are always fighting. And uh, they, they, lots of the, the food and the energy they have is spent on fighting. And you also you must realize, uh, whereas the, the the gift tilapia, the slow growing one, the the, the fast growing one, uh, uh, they they just quiet and they don't fight. Um, uh, this is also the case for salmon that you can see uh, in farming. They they behave themselves very differently from wild salmon. Uh, and and also we must realize that if you do an energy budget for fish. Uh, the most of the ATP or of the energy they have available is spent on activity, on moving around. It's not spent on growth. So a very small, a very small change in activity level is uh, uh, can generate a huge amount of growth and uh, somatic growth and gonad growth. I leave it at that. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. There were oh, but maybe, uh, perhaps I should uh, add one thing. There is a link between growth, between growth and reproduction, but it is the inverse. If conditions are bad for fish, they will not grow well and therefore spawn earlier. Rather than if conditions are bad, they spawn early and this, and then they don't grow well. It's inverted. Okay. So, thank you. So, Fedor, you had a couple of questions. Do you want to ask them? So, Graham, I think they won't be able to share their audio, so I think you'll have to read them. Oh, okay. Somewhere. All right. Let me yeah. go back up to the list of questions. So, Fedor Lischenko asks, um, why does increment deposition differ between species which have similar daily activity? Well, if the daily wings um, 
the daily wings that are deposited very clearly are uh, they are i i'm saying they are caused by change in ph which are due to very uh, uh change in activity during daytime and, and nighttime uh also if you have a storm going through reef you will have marks on on the the otoliths uh because the stress induce a uh, uh, lowering of ph now when when you say similar activities uh what looks similar to us might be different for for the fish um basically the the marking the markings are measures of stress and uh if they have different marking then they experience stress differently and and our ability to distinguish to to state that they are the condition are similar can be very wrong. Uh, it is similar to our children. We we have children and we love them both. I have two. We love them both, but they, they still experience a different thing because they have different ages and different uh they they we we think that we that condition are the same, but uh they are experienced as different. Uh that's true for children and it's probably true for fish also. Okay, and if I could ask Fedor's second question, he asks, is this transition ratio the same in animals living in warm and cold regions? Yep, yep. Uh, the, 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 the solidity or the, the, the constancy of this ratio, I'm now surprised about it because uh, I have made. Uh, I have worked on. I worked on several papers with uh, different people, and uh, and they it appears to be constant. And a paper was published in a journal of fish biology uh, with colleagues uh, from the state of Idaho, showing exactly the same uh, ratio uh, for 51 stock of salmonid and three species, and they got exactly the same value completely independently from me. So I presume that this ratio is very stable. And I, I will, um, uh, I've gotten uh, an award, uh, the, the Beverton Medal, and I will present uh, in a paper that, uh, that uh, I have to write for this, uh, a review of, of these cases. I'm, I'm finding this ratio everywhere. And uh, uh, basically, <clears throat> the the fish has to know has a fish has to anticipate the future the has you have a you have to predict the future that you cannot know and and uh monitoring the stress level that you experience is a way to go because if the stress level is too high you are going to be in trouble so you better do something about reproduction and so basically all you need is is a, a stress level that is enough and uh, the, when this stress enough is sufficient pop your spawn and uh and monitoring your oxygen consumption relative to your maintenance consumption in other words how often are you out of breath is enough uh, uh enables the fish to anticipate the future because the other theories uh, that exist uh for example hormonal cascade uh, if you read a textbook about uh, fish reproduction you will hear you will read and that is an important point you read that hormonal cascade start reproduction start with perceiving environmental stimuli and once you have perceived this stimuli uh, it uh, it goes to the pituitary and and then it triggers a uh, 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 hormonal cascade and about that i always bring the example of my son i have a beautiful son now he's uh, 40 but when he grew up in the philippines and he, he he was surrounded by beautiful ladies and he didn't see it because he was eight and uh, I, when he was nine he didn't see them either and so on until he was 13 14 and all of a sudden 
he saw them. Well, they were there all the time, but he didn't see them before. So what happened is not that the environmental stimuli has changed. It is that an internal state has changed. And uh, you have lots of fish, for example, cod, that spawn at age six. Well, what happens at age five? Why, do, why don't they perceive the stimuli for spawning? I, what you need is an internal state must be making you ready to perceive the stimuli. And uh, if you take sturgeon, big fish, they live 20 years before they reach adulthood and before they perceive the stimuli. What happens? That, that cannot, the stimuli cannot be the beginning because the beginning must be an internal state that makes you ready to perceive the stimuli. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So just scroll, scrolling down, there are a couple of questions Graham. from, hello. Graham, hi, could, you, could I make just a brief question? Could you um, reshare with us your email address? Because it seems some people didn't jot it down and I couldn't. I did, I did, uh, I, uh, I show it again. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, why don't you share it uh, now? Is it your institutional, like, yeah, email yeah. address? That's yeah. right. I have that one. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's all right. Yeah, I don't have. Yeah. I don't have any other. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, so we can write that in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, okay. So, so, so the next question down um, was from Francesc Pifera, asking, "How does Galt accommodate the situation of hermaphrodite fish, especially sequential hermaphrodites?" I haven't thought about it. Uh, I, I think it. I think it will not be contradicted, but I think it will be a refinement. And uh, and uh, I'm quite aware, quite aware of that they exist. And uh, I think that uh, the the internal state that I mentioned is. Uh, say that is uh, uh, one that uh, that they are first male and then female well the internal state then is telling them i should be ready to spawn and uh, if they are first uh, males then they they spawn as male and then they changed and become female but the 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 reason why they spawn is always the same uh, incidentally spawning is not in, in the gold is not a, is not a problem for growth. In fact, it is the reason why fish can continue to grow, because every time you spawn and you leave, you lose 10% of your weight, right? 10 to 20% of your weight, and 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 uh, gonads have to be supplied with oxygen. Otherwise, the egg would rot, right? Uh, the ovary would rot, and so uh, so. So a fish that is stressed by oxygen, uh, oxygen stress that has maturing eggs, when it gets rid of them, it is becomes lighter. It becomes less, less. It has less weight and less oxygen demand. So it's doing fine and and it can grow again. So uh, uh, when fish are very big, uh, the spawning the large spawning enabled them to survive from one season to the other. Okay, so, so there is a, a, a second question. I'll see if I can get this right because it's a, a longer question. So referring to the fact that in 80% of fish species, females grow more than males despite investing more in reproduction, Bateman's gradients in terms of variability of reproductive success between sexes and the result of sperm competition and sexual selection in males should be taken into account. Um, question. Uh, to me, the argument that 80% of the female of the fish species, uh, which I use fish base to calculate uh, this 80%, uh, that uh, the, where the female are bigger is an argument that uh, the production of gonad cannot be the reason, cannot be influencing growth. 
that that's the point. Uh, if it if it were if it were influencing growth, then uh, the female would be small would have to be smaller because they put more energy into producing gonad. So to me, rather than being uh, then reproduction influencing growth, what I have is in the gold is growth influence reproduction. So it basically the argument that is made that you reproduce and uh, you grow more slowly than if you are juvenile. First of all, it's not true. It's not the case. I've shown you that when you look at the weight growth curve. And the second po point is it's simply correlational. People have one observation and the other observation, and one follow after the other, and therefore they say it's the cause. Actually, the causality can be totally inverted, and uh, you, you there is absolutely no logical reason why it should not be growth in it should not be growth influencing reproduction rather than reproduction influencing growth. Uh, uh, it is very common that uh, we infer uh, we we mistake cause and effect. It is very common in science, and I, I believe this is the case here. And uh, let's not forget this point about the hormonal cascade. Uh, being triggered by environmental stimuli it it has to be wrong because because the environmental stimuli exist at the time where the juvenile does not respond and so if the juvenile don't respond and and you you say oh yes it's because they are juvenile you have a circular definition something must happen inside the juvenile that it becomes capable of perceiving the environmental stimuli. And, and that is not a hormonal cascade. This must be something else. And, and that logic mistake, this the logical mistake, has not been perceived by the people working on hormones. Uh, they, they tell us that the hormonal cascade is triggered off by environmental stimuli, but, but lots of fish experience lots of years with spawning season without spawning. So something must be wrong. OK, I think we, I can see another three questions. So from. I can't speak because I am oh. the next one. Please OK, me... so please go ahead. OK, yeah. thank you, Daniel. I am Laura Prieto from Cadiz. Uh, and my question is that one of your last slides is that the um, most affected fisheries for the future will be the tropical traditional fisheries, no? Because they are the ones that are going to be less fishes each time because of the temperature. So yeah. uh, uh, this is like uh, connected with the, um, the, um, the um, global temperature affecting the planet, those countries are the ones that are the proteins that they get mainly are from traditional fisheries. Yep. So they, they have, uh, as I see in your slide, they will be affected uh, twice. Most. Yep, yep. Uh, it is absolutely horrible that the countries that have not produced green, greenhouse gases that are not industrialized are going to be affected most. They're going to be affected on land because of drought, because of change, the temperature change that will uh, cause droughts, but that's a, uh, not my specialty. But uh, the tropics will see a decline of the fisheries. And that is a uh, show sure as amen in church because, because the fish are, the temperature for the fish are getting too big, too high. However, the problem is the tropical countries is also the countries where we know least about the fisheries themselves. There is overfishing, there is pollution, plastic pollution and other form of pollution, and there is this global warming situation. And the, it, it occurs all at the same time. And uh, that is a serious problem. Uh, it is very difficult to, 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 to find out if, if in a country the catch are not increasing or are decreasing, whether it's because of overfishing, because of pollution, or because of global warming. But we know that global warming has to influence them. And 
because because uh, because in every other ecosystem we we see the uh, the mean temperature of the catch increasing because of migration because of fish migrating and in the tropics we don't see that i i, I did with chinese colleagues uh, uh, a similar uh, work where we had where we compared the Shaoxiana sea which is this in the tropics with uh, the yellow sea with the the east china sea and the yellow sea which is uh, uh, very cold uh, in the north and the in the south china sea there was absolutely no change in the mean temperature of the catch because essentially they have lots of fish that are tropical and they are there or they are not there but but the one that remain are enough to keep the temperature of the catch at the same level in other in the other two ecosystem there is a clear uh, increase in the mean temperature of the catch because they are receiving species from the south china sea and that that is terrifying because 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 uh, the countries in the tropics are being punished for what we have done in the in the industrialized north thank you okay thanks i i'm seeing a, another four questions or, or comments and i think probably everybody who asked a question now has access to their microphone a antonella did you want to ask your question i i think antonella doesn't have access like it, it was just louder because uh, I, I, I just went through unlocking and and now the unlocking <laughs> seems to have been working but anyway uh, Anton, uh, antonella said i wonder how microplastics will I I interact with this picture in a metabolic sense well uh, microplastics are supposed to be inert right so they 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 will they are supposed to act only mechanically uh they get stuck in the gut of the fish and they die because they cannot feed or something uh, however microplastics have a big surface area and they are lipophilic uh so they they will accumulate a uh, persistent organic pollutant which are also lipophilic but they will that will either stress the animal or turn in the little fish or turn them into poison pills and <laughs> the tuna that eat the little fish will be then poisoned with uh, persistent organic pollutants but i the interaction i i don't i don't think the interaction will be detectable between oxygen uh, obviously if a fish is stressed because it is mechanically challenged by plastic in its stomach uh it, its oxygen consumption will go up and and it will not be able to digest any food and it will die but uh, the, the this is going to be the two things I, I i don't think we have to consider interaction between these two processes to understand them better okay so so C can anybody else use their microphone? Because I'm I'm seeing Pablo as unlocked, but I'm not sure if that's actually the case. If not, I'll carry on reading questions. So Pablo Peter had another question. Says fish size responds strongly to fishing. Both uh, increasing temperatures and fishing are driving us to lower fish size. Then, which trend yeah. will be stronger? Well, uh, the the reduction of of size by fishing uh, is well documented, and it 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 occurs at two levels. It occurs at the ontogenic level, uh, that is, uh, individual fish get uh, the big ones get removed, and and that removes the the that push the average size down. Uh, that uh, is even a, a method to estimate mortality, and. There is another one, an evolutionary effect, where the small fish uh, get an advantage, evolutionary an advantage, uh, if fishing is constantly uh, applied, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, this evolutionary advantage of the small fish over the big fish uh, within a species um, uh, is well studied. Uh, for example, by uh, by uh, people in Norway. And uh, 
they speak of a Darwinian debt uh, uh, because uh, you 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 lose the genes. The, the gene frequency is uh, modified in the population, and you lose the genes that uh, that contribute to fast growth. And it will take hundreds of years to re to reestablish the the uh, the the balance of genes that were were there. And uh, basically, small fish uh, and and then the gold and, and uh, what we know about physiology also has to keep the fish small and um, the the effect uh, will are confounded uh, but they can be separated because uh, we have theories about uh, both uh, aspect or all three aspect the ontogenic effect uh, that we remove uh, the big one the the evolutionary effect that we remove the genes of the big ones and uh, the temperature effect uh, the metabolic effect we we have we have a, a reasonable understanding of all three effects and therefore we can actually uh, at least in principle we can separate them yeah okay there's a question here from miguel planus and let's see if i can get this right regarding biochemical changes in fish uh, species migrating to other areas so as to maintain their temperature would conserve their fatty acid profiles, um, namely polyunsaturated fatty acids, um, cell permeability, um, unlike those species that cannot migrate and would consequently suffer an increase in temperature. I, I, is that a correct interpretation? Uh, it I, I think so, but uh, it is outside of my area of expertise because I don't really know about 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 this biochemical profile of fish. But uh, I presume that the fish that migrate or that move north and south, uh, let's not 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 as a part of uh, <clears throat> of the seasonal migration, but uh, the it's not really a migration uh, it is uh, that a fish uh, have if they have a distribution say in the northern hemisphere uh, the the population more in the north will do better than the population in the south and so gradually the distribution moved north uh, perhaps no no single fish has really moved uh, this is not really a migra migration like uh, the seasonal migration of west africa that i spoke about there, the fish migrate, uh, and they, when fish find themselves in another place, uh, I, I, they will man, they will try to maintain everything that they, they have evolved to like, or to to need. But uh, it is possible that they prey did not move the same way, or that their prey is not available. Uh, and that they have new predators, and so they will. They will in a new site, in a new place where they're going to be, they will have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I, for example, one can one can see that cod will be doing fine in the in the high Arctic. Uh, we we now have we can see Pacific uh, salmon establishing their, themselves in northern Alaska and in northern um uh in northern uh, uh, Canada uh and they the established runs salmon that uh, in rivers that never had any salmon and the Inuits the Inuit uh, es Eskimo the Inuits uh have a very have very surprised but about this fish that they don't know about <laughs> that uh, beginning to establish themselves yeah. Thanks. So uh, I think I can see one more question from Emmanuel Diakos, um, who starts by saying, hello, thank you very Thank you for your very informative presentation. And I might say there's a large number of similar messages on the chat. Um, then taking into consideration that morphological plasticity in the paleal organs, that is gills, labial palps, 
of invertebrate Japanese oyster has been observed in relation to turbid waters. Do you think there could be a similar pattern of fish gill plasticity in relation to temperature um, or possibly transgenerational effects? Uh, it is, it is uh, well established that uh, there are species of fish uh, whose uh, gill development is strongly influenced by the environmental condition. And so uh, they can, some of them can sprout more gills and uh, they are deep water fish that even sprout external gills. The, however, they, the problem with, with gills is that they function as a surface. And so they, they will never be able to match the growth of a volume. They, there is always this point that they must function as a surface and they cannot grow in the third dimension. So, so, so fish can grow better, gill, bigger gills, but they, this is going to be at the cost of another organ system. They, this is going to be uh, some cost, and it solved the problem only halfway because uh, if they if they grow bigger gills to compensate for an increase in temperature, and they're doing fine, the next increase in temperature they will not be able to compensate anymore. So the adaptive capacity uh, is there uh, in, in, in both invertebrates and fish. Uh, there is some adaptive capacity. They can also reduce the, the oxygen consumption by switching over to, to uh, glycolytic enzyme and stuff. But, but there is a limit and the, the, of this adaptability and what I call dimensional tension. The problem with gills that are surface and a volume, the oxygen demand that is a volume, that remains. And, and therefore, the solution is only, it can only be partial solution to uh, accommodate the first one degree of temperature increase. But they, then, then we have the next degree and they cannot deal with this. Or then if they can accommodate the next one, there is a third one degree that they cannot accommodate because the tension remains. Okay, so thank, thank you very much. I, I think that was all the questions. So I think it remains to me to thank you very much on behalf of everybody and possibly if people's cameras and microphones are unblocked, they're uh, uh, welcome to, to show themselves. Um, but if not, in any case, thank you on behalf of everybody and, and thank you for, for, to everybody for, for joining us. Um, I, I should say before I forget that this is part of a, an ongoing series. So there is another um, talk on Friday the 21st of, of May um, by Marta Cole called oh. Winners winners losers and i think marta is is probably here i saw her yeah, earlier she is. she is hello marta um and uh, it's called winners losers and shifts in the mediterranean pelagic ecosystem integrating knowledge and projecting and trajectories so again thanks very much daniel that, 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 that was great thank you very much hope uh, to meet you in vivo sometime I, I hope so. You just just get rid of get rid of COVID in your, in your, in your town. We will. We will. I, I had a first dose. I, I need a second dose, and then I can go to any place where people are vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See you. Thank you. Okay. See you. So yes, thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. So much. Uh, and, right. and thank bye. you. Bye just now.